Solo leveling proves it deserves all the hype and more after episode three. I swear to God, that was after episode two, too. Episode three wasn't that good, but let's see what it's Brandon has to say. Soul leveling episode three cements itself as worthy of all the hype it's received and probably more because you could look at an episode like episode two and mm -hmm. there's people who just will dislike shows like these and say the only reason people are hyping it up is because look at the blood, look at the action. Even if people like me are saying the whole reason episode two was so good was because of the riddle and how they didn't. I feel like some people are just rage baiting because they realize that if they say a controversial opinion, just basically anything that goes against the popular opinion on Twitter or Reddit, suddenly a bunch of sh a bunch of people will just then start engaging with it. It's the easiest way to get engagement online, right? A everyone is a fucking attention whore. Like, what am I doing right now? I'm just making videos for attention too. But a bunch of people that, you know, are probably lonely and wants to be part of a community but can't do so decides that this is the simplest way to get any sort of engagement because their lives are so fucking meaningless and the only way they can feel something is by just saying solo leveling trash on twitter then you got fucking 20 different kids saying no you're fucking trash then it's just a heated argument but at least they feel something didn't just let a character brute force his way through and actually had to think and the way the writing kind of wrote that entire trial that's what we really loved about it. Everything else was bonus. So an episode like episode three that comes in and yes, does have some action, but it's basically all about the exploration. Of it was just all set up. It was a lot of dialogue, more world building. There was hardly any fighting except until the goblin scene, which is actually pretty good. The choreography during that goblin fighting scene had no reason being that good. The menu system, the becoming a player, how- Oh, sorry. My fucking shitty ass fucking AirPods are disconnecting again. Why do you do this to me? Why the fuck? Uh, becoming oh my god, I can't fucking eat. Oh my god, Jesus Christ. Sometimes it gets so statically after this. No, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Being a player, how apparently uh, are you, only our- Are you serious? Is, are, are, are you fucking serious right now? And this isn't even showing up right now? Emergency! All right, here we go. <laughs> fucking stupid, dude. Fucking stupid. Paying fucking 400 goddamn fucking dollars for this piece of shit. It doesn't fucking work half. No, I'm sorry. It actually does work. It actually does work really well. It's just sometimes it fucking disconnects and gets all static. It's like, what the fuck? This and potentially might be the only person in the world who has anything like it. We have no idea. An episode like this comes in, lets us explore the world first and foremost, and what it's going to do to a character who, as they say, like an E rank in this world for their hunters, probably would read on the meter like a 70 or something. Yeah, like an average E rank would be 70 points, but bro scored 10 because he is technically the weakest weakest e rank ever right still crazy and look there's five digit places bro nine, nine oh yeah so was it no and it wasn't 70 for a regular normal civilian i forgot the reference they made but they clearly compared like oh my god he's only 10 points but look at this shit five fucking decimal places dude nine 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 Almost 100,000 is like the maximum recording on this thing. And bro scored 10. Well, thankfully, they didn't record us, you know, before we started leveling. I wonder what this meter would say after we allocated those, like, first couple strength points. Because we're not that strong, but the strength got up to, like, 30-something points. I just want to know how much that impacts this score. This man, even after what they thought was going to be his second awakening, still is reading at 10. So, the whole idea that the solo leveler, he's going to go probably through multiple dungeons... Yes. Level up, but it's not all through these instance dungeons and they probably so what I'm getting from these instance dungeons right versus a regular dungeon is that instant dungeon is literally just the training zone, right? It's just a little dungeon that I'm not sure if it's high stakes just yet, but so far we just go in there, clear out mobs, you just get a bunch of EXP. It's just a very convenient way to farm. Compared to regular dungeons where they're just like they just spawn randomly, right? Instances are given just as like a gift, like a fucking daily quest and you did it. It's like, congratulations, go farm this like time gated content more. It just reminds me of a fucking mobile game, dude. It's not just gonna be about watching the cool fights. Those are gonna be amazing and those are gonna be exciting. A1 Pictures is clearly animating these things with a lot of polish. The thing that's gonna keep us there is legitimately enjoying an MC who doesn't just say, ooh, now I'm a player in my own reality, so I get to just power my way through. Eventually that's pretty much like a lot of the isekais we're watching right now. In this show, the MC has to fucking just start from the bottom up and the grind is fucking hard, right? Now, it's not to say that every isekai is just cheap like that. I feel like 
What's the most recent isekai that we watched where I felt like the main character actually fucking deserved getting the power ups he got? I think Ari Furuta is a good one, right? Nagumo, he just had to... I don't want to spoil if you haven't seen this isekai, but he suffers a lot. There's a lot of suffering that goes into a couple of initial episodes to get to the point he is. And doing stuff like that makes me feel like the main character earns it. Compared to like a guy who just gets spawned into an isekai world and he's like, huh... I'm an isekai MC. Look at my powers. Wow, I can do all these things. Those kind of animes is fun for like instant death. Yogi D, exactly, right? Instant death. Now, he's a bit different because it's he didn't get those powers immediately, bro. Like, all, MASH, Saitama, those people didn't get those powers immediately. Well, we're getting off topic, but there's a lot of these shows... And you just mentioned three separate shows where the comedy is the focus point there rather than the heavy drama of the fighting. When the characters are immediately OP like that, I feel like this is a deconstruction or a parody of those kind of power fantasies and they focus more on the, the comedy side of it rather than it being supposed to be a super serious like drama. It's not. The comedy is the highlight. So for OP characters immediately, if you focus on the comedy, it's not bad. But if you try to like focus less on the comedy, just it's always serious all the time, Suddenly, it feels a little cheap, and Sun Jin Wu being able to get these powers after having suffering so much, it feels a little bit more worthy, don't you think so? Eventually, he's going to have confidence, and eventually, he's not going to be as afraid. But it makes sense that someone who's lost an arm and a leg recently, even if it's come back, who's been stabbed by goblins, is going to have a bit of trauma and PTSD going up against things, especially by himself, where he can no longer run away. This show is worthy of the hype, and it's probably going to be worthy of so much more as each episode releases. Mm -hmm. I have a full live reaction to today's wonderful Check out his Patreon. episode available on my Patreon. Patreon. So if you would like to see my full link of thoughts, they're over there if you're interested. Now, this was, in my opinion, an even more entertaining episode than last week. I think... Really? I mean, Brandon probably enjoys different things, right? Last week's episode, I think, to the vast majority of the audience, that's going to get... It, it's it's, it's, it's going to be a lot more engaging and fun, right? He probably enjoys the world building, the different things that they're explaining, all this cool little interest, like the mechanisms of like, oh, you have a menu and you get these three daily, you know, three daily rewards if you clear a daily quest. And you get like stat attributions and you get fucking random gacha box and, you know, full recovery. And you, if you don't do the fucking, what's it called? Dailies on time, you get transported to like a fucking sand place and you have to survive for like four fucking hours, like stuff like that. It was pretty fun to get to know the world more. I think the majority will probably say last week was more exciting because it was more brutal and intense. But for me, this is exactly what I was looking for. They didn't even need to give me any action this week, and I would have been completely satisfied with how they were handling the development of our MC. Waking up, basically having no idea what's happened. Is he taller? Did his voice get deeper? Am I just fucking schizo because I'm trying to pinpoint the point, the part where he starts to actually change in terms of actual design? Like, I'm going schizo trying to point out, like, trying to think about, is he changing yet? And now he has daily quest logs. The daily quests are so interesting to me because what's really fascinating about, I think, the penalty side of it. The fact that you can just get teleported. Like, think about it, right? This is a ridiculous mechanism because, like, I'm not sure what the limitation of this daily quest is. But it seems like if you don't do your dailies on that day, you get teleported to the sand area. Now, think about this as a fucking escape option. Because, like, even in, like, um, when we enter the subway dungeon later on, the instance dungeon, didn't it say that in order to leave, you need to clear out all the monsters or have some kind of, like, teleportation, right? So couldn't you then assume that, hey, hold up. What if we intentionally don't do our dailies as a way of, you know, as an escape mechanism for the future where we're locked into a situation, right? I don't know what the restrictions are for his dailies, but the fact that you can just teleport like that, I think they made a big point about he just disappeared in the hospital. That's like a huge deal. Daily right now, it's like training, right? Because he's weak as hell. He needs to build up his stamina, his muscles and everything like that. What is it? Like 100 push-ups, run this one punch distance, band. Yeah, one punch man workout. It's not really the craziest thing ever, but I mean, it makes sense that you're like, I literally just came out of a dungeon from Death's doorstep. I'm going to go take a nap. The fact that the punishments probably are related to whatever the quest is. Right now, it's just daily strength training. So when he fails to do it, a miniature earthquake occurs and he's thrown into this sandy desert location. Who knows where that is? poisonous centipede-like beast that for four hours he has to sprint because you can't skip leg day, bro. You tried to do it, so they're going to force you or you will die. And I think had he actually killed in that kind of like sandy location it wasn't just a dream he probably would have stayed dead and those nurses would have found 
a severed body and wondering what the hell just happened. The I wonder, would the body even been transported back to the world? I don't know. Would it have just been stuck in this desert place? What is this desert place? I don't fucking know. The fact that he accepted being a player, he was on Death's doorstep, so now he has these missions. But I think the idea of the missions and the quests are going to be really interesting because they're time-based, right? The daily ones, of course, have a 24-hour limit. There might be weekly ones that will take seven days. Maybe oh, there God. Will be quests weekly quests, monthly long, quests. Three days and three hours long. We have no idea. There's a lot of flexibility with the timeline, but we have to consider the fact that that these quests have to be completed else you get a penalty. Right now the penalty is run from a giant centipede for four hours. Eventually it could be complete this quest or die. Complete this quest or suffer a loss. Will the dailies get harder? I don't know, right? If what Brandon's saying here, if it actually starts to scale with his abilities, that's gonna get scary. If it actually just stays static like this and just like it's like an easier farm every time, then it's cool where Dailies aren't supposed to be something you just focus all your time in, right? Eventually, you're trying to automate this process. You fucking log on 10 seconds and you're fucking out. Hopefully, it's not 10 seconds. Usually, it's a lot longer than that. But I was hoping that as we got stronger, these daily quests would continue to give us the same amount of awards, if not more, without the difficulty getting stronger. Because that just seems like a fucking... That's like a fucking job. It's just a fucking chore. And what does that loss mean? A death of a loved one? Who the hell knows? So what happens when his real life is kind of overlapping with these quests? I don't know. Like, I'm thinking of a situation like in the first Spider-Man movie where Green Goblin says, hey, choose the passengers or choose Mary Jane. Pick one. Because Both. eventually there's going to come situations where... He has to complete a quest without a major penalty, and at that point, he probably realizes the type of penalties he might get, or, you know, ruin relationships, if not, maybe not be able to save someone. It I feel like if we ever get thrown into that kind of ultimatum, Sun Jing Wu is the kind of character where he'll just figure out a way to save both. You know, those are the types of questions that, that an episode like this brings me, and that's what makes these types of, of episodes so captivating. See, this, this is why this episode is more interesting to Brandon, because he's a fucking thinker. He, like, like, getting introduced to new mechanics and stuff and rules like this makes his brain go, go crazy. While the most of us, we're just watching this show like monkeys. We just see episode two and go, oh, statue, go stomp. For me. Because rather than just starting the show off saying, oh, you know, he gets his power up and he's about to become the glass cannon bill, because that's clearly what he's building into, or at least that's how it feels to me. So interesting that he's like building all the way into strength while leaving dexterity alone because we see in all the fights he uses a fucking dagger which I'm gonna assume that he's gonna be some kind of thief or roguelike class, right? But he's just going all in strength which makes sense because you do need a little bit of strength I guess in the beginning because he's so goddamn weak and he needs some sort of like foundation. The MC in soul leveling basically is putting all of his stats in this new video game menu that he now has that apparently only he can see into strength and just all right strength now he's at like 31 strength are we going all unga bunga on strength i don't know man take and very clearly he's a lot more talented he doesn't have technique right now that's all going to come in time with practice and all the training that he's going to do but i love the idea that he's very clearly at some point going to have like 999 strength like i feel like that's what he's going to do and mm. as long as he gets who knows where even this caps out at, right? Is it triple, is it quadruple? Who knows? His technique down, I mean, he's dodging all right right now. He eventually is going to be a one-man army, and it's going to be very fun to see because this is the type of character you want to follow in a power fantasy because you actually want to root for him, and he actually seems like a likable dude. This is just such a good show. It's beautifully produced. Right away when the video game menus were all in front of him, like his HUD, I love the little kind of like the glow effects and how it kind of moves around. It's not just the static menu in front of him. The when he opens up the gate, how it like electrifies or how it then turns to almost like a barrier, which really cool. He's basically in And like other normal people can just go through those random random barriers, right? That was kind of cool. Like a reality within a reality. All the general civilians. Reality within a reality. Interesting, huh? A reality within a reality, but we're in a game. Or at least Sung Jin Woo is the only game. Or at least he's the only player in the game. I don't know. Are there more players? I don't fucking know. Bunch of people are trying to fucking spoil me in my comment section. But, like, if you are a player that play, I'm, pr I'm surprised that Brand is not talking about this. Maybe he will in, in a bit. But, like, if you're a player, what are you a player of? Player of a game. If someone has to create the game. Does Game Maker design all the portals and the powers for fun? Who fucking knows, but this is some endgame plot territory, right? And still walking through, can't see him, can't see this barrier, but of course he can't pass through. He kills three goblins, and he Let's doesn't go. just do what I thought he was going to do, which was pretty much immediately one-shot them. He was struggling, because... It makes sense, though, because he doesn't... Even though he could one-shot them, he doesn't have the experience to actually fight them, and so far these goblins have just clapped his cheeks every time he's gone into a dungeon, so... 
It's kind of, it's kind of like that in the healing uh, anime too, the wrong way to use healing magic where the main character got a lot of strength but he doesn't have experience so he's kind of like scared and doesn't know what to really do against these like monsters that he should be able to fight. Because obviously his first mission that he went on, we get the confirmation, his entire reason, which we knew he was like a hunter for his mom's sake, but they can't afford the treatment for their mother unless they have a lot of money. So going on these missions that, you know, he's getting stabbed in the chest, he's feeling fearful because what guy wouldn't be fearful of these monster looking beasts? especially when he isn't the strongest person in this world. He's struggling, he's fearful, but he has a decent dodge going on, and once he starts slicing and dicing, he does rather well before the... the it has a jaw of steel, man. Like, that thing's gonna hurt. I'm just... I'm basically cheering. I'm like, give that boy an uppercut and then... I can't believe they gave us a fucking cliffhanger with this red wolf thing. Like, it's not even, like, an important monster either, right? But they had to have, like, a like an end point in the last episode. I'm like, uh-oh, we're getting to the end. We just introduced this new red dog. It's not really a fucking boss monster, but, like, really? You're gonna give me a fucking cliffhanger? All right, fuck you. Punch downwards on his skull and crack the skull, because his blade broke, right? So he's gonna have to think on his feet. Maybe he'll just pick up one of the goblin's weapons. I don't know. But he has to defeat a floor boss, right? He either has to fight a floor boss, or I think the other can do... Does he? I didn't, I didn't know that's part of the mechanics. Like, we have to actually... I thought it was just clear the dungeon out, but I guess it's safe to assume that there is a boss within this instance. ...mission was find, like, a teleporter in order to get out of that. He's probably gonna fight the boss. Here's the thing. Find a teleporter to get out of it. What happens if you didn't do your dailies today, and you just fucking waited, and the timer went off? Wouldn't you technically be teleported out? But then after you... you you've passed, like, that four-hour punishment, I guess you get teleported back into the dungeon. So I guess there's no point. Yeah, I still feel like this could be a useful mechanic in the future, man. man like, that's what we're going to be building into. It's probably going to be like a hobgoblin or something, maybe. I don't know. That's kind of my vibe that I'm getting. But either way, it's going to be very interesting. The only thing I guess is a little weird is that I thought they were going to bring up the fact that he lost a leg and an arm. And yes, mm. a lot of the characters didn't realize that. But, you know, the girl who's... True. Juhi should have been like, hold the fuck. How did you get your leg and arm back? Well, there wasn't a chance to actually talk like that. And she was just kind of outside look, bringing flowers to his room, but then he was already outside exercising. But did Juhi even remember? Well, no, Juhi should have seen the foot get cut off at least. That, wait, this is a fucking hole! Suffering PTSD, not wanting to go on missions anymore. She literally is seeing him train. Like, maybe it's yeah, just in this world what the fuck? good prosthetics, and that's what she thought happened. But I really was expecting her to be... Well, S rank heroes are apparently they can like regrow limbs, so it's it might not be a big deal. Like, wait a second, didn't he lose his limbs? Because she literally saw that. So maybe that's a conversation for another day. But either way, this is the episode I needed to see because I wasn't expecting all the answers. I just wanted to learn more about what will happen now that he's this quote unquote player. Yeah. And they have me talk about the player though, Brandon. What does a player mean? Player of a game. What is a game? Someone created the game. I'm surprised a big brain guy like him isn't talking or theorizing about that. Really eager for more. Of course, popular series aren't going to be for the every single person out there but i think anyone who's claiming that you just watch solo leveling for the crazy action is kidding themselves because <laughs> um i feel like there's definitely a big portion of the audience that don't give a fuck about like episode three where they don't give a shit about these different mechanics of, you know, daily quest, new, new skills, stat allocation. They just want to see more cool moments and hype fights and nothing wrong with that. But there also definitely is um, like this show delivers on both ends, right? For the normies that just wants the hype scenes like episode two, absolutely. You can just watch it and not care about stuff like that. But for also the big thinkers, the big brain, you know, the big brain monkeys that wants to get a little bit more uh, engulfed in this lore and this world building and all these different things that they're introducing. I think there's definitely content for that type of audience. So it definitely does cover both sides of the spectrum. Because from episode one now to episode three, the things that I've continued to rave about the most is the writing. The writing is the thing that actually makes me most interested. The action is just an added bonus. Let me know what you thought of episode three of Soul Leveling down below, though. Leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe for new rad. Y'all know what to do. Give Age Brandon videos, reviews, a sub, like his videos if you did. People are saying that soon we are about to embark on a journey to become not Sun Jing Wu, but Sun Drip Wu. And as you can see, he's already rocking the full Adidas tracksuit now. His hairstyle needs to change a bit. When will he actually change? Next episode? After we clear the instance dungeon? We'll see you next time.